the Autism Research Institute relies on the generosity of donors like you to make this webcast possible. If you enjoy this presentation, please consider making a donation. Thank you. Now, before we get started, I'll introduce our nutritionist. Kelly Barnhill is the director of the Nutrition Clinic at the Johnson Center for Child Health and Development. She's a certified clinical nutritionist with over a decade of experience working with nutrition in children with autism and related disorders. At the Johnson Center, she directs a team of dietitians and nutritionists that has served more than 3,000 children through the practice. In addition to her clinical practice, Kelly also serves as the Johnson Center Clinical Care Director, overseeing management and implementation of multidisciplinary care across the practices within the organization. In 2008, Kelly accepted the position of Nutrition Coordinator for the Autism Research Institute. In this role, she designs and manages training online each year, as well as providing direct training for parents through these webinars. Kelly is a sought-after presenter, speaking at several national and international conferences each year. These webinars are made possible through generous donor support. If you'd like to contribute, please visit our website at autism.com. So now we'll get started. Kelly, welcome. Thank you. And we've got a lot of questions today, so I'll just launch right into them. Okay, great. So the first one I've got here, how do I continue to implement and support dietary intervention as my child gains independence? When they are in high school, what about college? So our... Uh, our approach here in the clinic um, is as the children we serve grow up, <laughs> um, we tend to bring those kids into the professional appointments as early as possible when that's relevant so that they have buy-in from the very beginning in creating a plan that works for them um, because as a, as a practitioner, I want to know that the 15-year-old sitting across the table from me feels comfortable saying, you know, I don't want to do this anymore, or I want to try that. Um, and it totally depends on the individual child and what role they can play in a meeting like that clearly, but as early and as much as possible as we can involve them in that process, we do. Um, and then I think it takes from a parental perspective, and you know, uh, as with everything we do with our teenagers, um, a little bit of faith that providing the information and the opportunity um, is going to go far, and continuing to learn the environment, whatever that high school environment looks like, um, whatever college looks like. When we have kids who are now college students or in college, uh, living experiences um, who have been very successful following a dietary intervention when we work with them and the dorm or uh, the parents to confirm that we make a, that the food they need can be available at all times and once we check those boxes um, I feel like as parents and also practitioners we do everything we can to enable the child to be successful. Um, will there probably be slip-ups and infractions? Yes. Uh, but I also feel like that's part of this growing process for us as parents, too. Um, so I think that um, enabling the child with as much knowledge is important and then providing the appropriate environment and educated people in that environment to help out when necessary is our approach. Okay, thank you. The next one is about different supplements. This person's asking, in your experience with nutritional supplements, which ones, if any, have the most dramatic benefit for the most people? So, for example, cod liver oil or B6 or B12 injections. So I know it'd be difficult to generalize across all people, but have you seen specific supplementation strategies that tend to be beneficial across the board? Um, it is really hard to tease out that answer because every child is so different, but 
uh, in general, over the past, you know, 15 years, I would say that the things that we see that are um, the most commonly used and employed with kids that we serve are uh, essential fatty acids, which can be of enormous value when used appropriately. Um, a good omega, high quality omega-3 supplement at the appropriate dose seems to do wonders for many, many children that we serve. Um, the tricky part there is that it's not as simple as choosing an over-the-counter omega-3 and thinking that you're doing it or that you've done that intervention because choosing the right product and the right dose and the right ratio of omega-3s and omega-6s in it even can be hard. So you really need to be working with someone who can help you do that. Um, but I would say essential fatty acids, um, magnesium B6, B12. Those would be things that when used appropriately, we see the most significant response in the largest number of kids from a nutrient perspective. Okay, and so building on that, so what advice would you give parents who are just beginning with vitamin treatment, or not treatment, but vitamin supplementation and enzyme supplements? What are some tips about um, working with younger children on that? Um, I, I think that you need to make sure that you're working with a professional who knows the um, audience, who has done this a while and understands dosages and brands, because those are key to being successful with those interventions. And then you need to make sure that you're using um, you're making sure that it's getting in every day on a consistent basis and you're taking lots of data so that you can see if it works or not. Um, so I, it's really important to um, make sure that timing of doses is appropriate and to make sure that you give timing of introduction of the next thing that you're going to try um, every, so that everything is staggered and you can very clearly see and document what's working and what may not be working. And then, I guess, the practicality of just being able to get a child to accept um, a supplement that might be new or different, like the fish oil that I mentioned. Uh, and there are lots of um, tips and tricks, and you can find some of those on our website, and I'm sure some on the autism.com website as well, um, to get those supplements in so that you can be successful. Okay, the next piece of that, this is a related question, they're asking about what type of professional workup you'd recommend to get at those biological underpinnings or to pinpoint specific gaps in that individual's ability to process nutrients. So that would be both things that you might do initially and then ongoing monitoring if they're testing that you would suggest. Okay. Um, I think that's a great question because for the most part, uh, the data that we want to see up front for any child that we work with um, is fairly fundamental and we ask that information of most of the kids that we see with some additional variables that we will order if we feel like they're necessary and if the parent feels like it's something they've learned about and they want that information. Um, so for us, really a basic workup to begin to piece together the biochemical issues that are involved here would include really um, simple, straightforward blood work like a CBC and a CMP. Vitamin D levels we look at. I always like to look at ferritin and iron panels because that gives us some information that um, I feel like we should be gathering in standard pediatric practice, and we're not, and, and it helps us treat a number of things pretty quickly if those numbers are awry. Um, I, we also look at thyroid function, and that is um, something that we can address, or we also speak to with um, supplementation if necessary. We, for some children, we include a lipid panel, depending on their age. Um, and then for specific nutrient testing, we use a number of um, 
private labs that pr can provide us with information on uh, methylation status and uh, utilization of uh, nutrients such as amino acids and vitamins and mineral levels as well. Um, I often like to get, uh, particularly if there is a history of significant illness or antibiotic use, a, a GI panel as well, so a, a comprehensive parasitology that will give us some information both on um, any bacterial or fungal overgrowth as well as um, inflammatory markers in the GI tract. And that kind of gives us a basic picture. Sometimes we will order allergies if we have a child who is, presents with this, a history um, that would make that relevant. Sometimes we will order food intolerance panels because parents often come in and that's where they would like to start and I respect their wishes in doing that. Um, and it gives us more data to work with, I think. Um, but then there are, you know, a handful or two of other tests that we would add on either based on these results or based on information gathered in that first consult to help us refine and get the most information possible to make the best plan moving forward. Okay. Um, this next question is about, uh, it's a parent who's struggling with picky eaters, or a, a picky eater. So the question is this, I have an eight-year-old son with autism. My son has always had issues being a picky eater or liking an item one day and then hating it the next. I feel that I never know what I'm going to get. I'm concerned regarding his weight and bowel issues. This month he lost two pounds. Last month he did not gain. and the prior month he lost a pound. He's 50 pounds and is eight years and four months. I started ABA therapy two months ago. It helps getting him to eat the days they are present. So they're saying that their therapists are, are helping with the feeding. I have put complaints into the school he attends and they have done nothing to ensure that he eats. If I pack a lunch, the lunch comes back home with a nibble or nothing has been touched. In addition, he does not like to go to the bathroom at school and often becomes constipated. I feel at a loss. Do you have advice? Oh, I have lots of thoughts on this one. <laughs> um, first, I would say from an administrative perspective, that you can ask for those concerns about the school environment to be addressed in an IEP setting so that the child has support and um, the skill of participating in a lunch both from an eating perspective and also socializing perspective is supported with an aid if necessary, and I think that's crucial to know that your child is being taken care of and that food is going in um, because it is very hard. I understand your concerns completely when a lunchbox comes back full and your child has not eaten in a seven hour period, his brain can't be functioning where it needs to be functioning. Um, and so I would say it would be a priority to get that addressed in the IEP as well as the toileting skills that you mentioned, that could also be addressed through that documentation and that process so that you can feel comfortable with him there. Um, and then to speak to his food preferences, if you were working with an ABA therapist who actually has experience in um, feeding and feeding behaviors, I think it's awesome and you have that opportunity to actually make a plan um, with, regarding the food that you want to introduce and then have that team begin to shape his behavior in accepting new foods and, his, and shaping his generalized behavior around food and feeding in general. There are programs, you know, we have several um, feeding specialists that we work with who can either work at a distance on a consultative basis or um, work uh, in a uh, short-term, um, one-week or two-week program to address feeding behavior. Um, and I think a good starting point might be finding someone who can do some of the basic testing that I mentioned and also um, do a complete review of 
just what's going into his body now and then help you um, manage making small changes with that that he may um, that may be beneficial to him and that he may accept. Um, but I think that has to be a plan created with a professional so you know what the um, what the best strategies are. And ideally, that would include the nutritionist and the ABA specialist working together in that approach. In the meantime, is there anything that the mom can provide that might, that you've seen successful just to get calories in? Are there smoothies or any foods just to stop? I think that um, if it's a dire or urgent situation and um, you feel strongly about just getting calories in since he's been kind of fluctuating in this way over the past few months. You can, there are smoothie recipes that we use with children who we're trying to help and assist in gaining weight and I'd be happy to share those with you. Um, because of the way that we load them calorically, they are nutrient and also calorie dense but full of, you know, natural ingredients. Um, and I'm happy to share those, those recipes and ratios with you. The question is, are, would you be able to use that with your ABA team to get the, get the calories in? And if you can, I'm, I'm happy to provide that. Um, if you just want to contact me via Denise, I guess. Okay, great. Thank you so much on that one. I know that mom's feeling pretty, pretty stressed. So on this next one, this is a gentleman who has a 38-year-old son who is on the spectrum, and he has serious digestive challenges. Father says, if we limit his meat intake, that seems to help a lot. My question is, what is a complete protein? I hear a lot about beans and rice as being complete, but I have no idea what that actually means. How is that different from simply protein as listed in books like Food Counts? Are there reference, chart, reference charts or books to help me figure out how to get complete proteins in? How important is this issue? I love this question um, because it lets me think about proteins and amino acids um, and break that all down. Um, and I guess first, what we've learned in the past 40 years about the way that most of us eat and the complete amino acid makeup that we're trying to make is that um, we don't necessarily have to, if we're choosing a vegetarian or vegan approach, we don't have to worry about complete protein intake at every meal at every time because there was a belief um, for the, a long time that to be able to assimilate all those amino acids, they had to be um, consumed together and that would be what a complete protein would be. And so there was a lot of mapping to make sure that all those amino acids were consumed at certain meals at certain times. And um, what we know now really is uh, we can get those amino acids in through plant sources. And there are so many different plant sources out there now. So there are beans, there are lentils, um, there are uh, grains now that are on the market that we can use, such as quinoa and amaranth. Um, there are also products that have come to the market that um, are made from pea protein or rice po protein, um, and which will all um, augment any protein intake coming from plant sources, as it were. I, I also feel like um, I don't think that I'm overstepping here, but if your son enjoys consuming meat and then and there's an issue with digestion and absorption afterwards, one thought would be to think about using a digestive enzyme that's targeted specifically at protein digestion. Um, and you could have that conversation with his treating primary care practitioner um, because there are a number of quality enzymes that are available and if utilizing that could help him digest something that he enjoys, I'm not saying that's a fix for every meal, but it would also give him some comfort in, in a food that he enjoys and you knowledge that perhaps it's helping him through that, um, the troubles with his digesting it as well. Okay, 
The next one, we are trying to manage our son's weight. He's overweight, and I'm wondering about Powerade, sports drinks, and cal are they really calorie-free? And what about Air Pop popcorn? Is that low in calories? Other parents are asking these questions as well, so I, I wondered if we'd wrap that all together. Several parents are asking about helping a child who's, who's suffering from obesity or who is overweight while trying to use a healthy diet. So what are some strategies there? So we really, uh, in terms of um, children and adolescents, when we face this question, my approach and our approach here is to be very cautious and kind of provide a wraparound approach to it. I always start with a food diary so I have the exact data that we need to make a decision from. Um, because there are children that we see in clinic who can consume 4,000 calories a day and still be under the 25th percentile. And then there are children who we see who can consume 1,200 calories a day and be in the 95th plus percentile. And that data helps us, helps us really understand what we need to be changing and monitoring. But in general, our approach is real food. So vegetables, fruits, lean proteins, healthy fats, some um, complex carbs in the forms of uh, root vegetables and appropriate grains. Um, that seems to be the premise. And so what for us that means is ideally the packaged goods or anything that is you know, in the center aisles of the grocery store, we move away from and we move toward those things that we call real food. So um, air popped corn is lower in calories than um, a, a popcorn snack that is prepared in oil. Um, but it's not necessarily low calorie. M monitoring and managing the portion size would be important there. Um, it certainly can be a filling snack. And in terms of Powerade, Powerade Zero really is calorie free, but we're learning more and more that calorie free and zero calorie drinks can also contribute to weight gain. Um, and so for us, I tend to tell families, choose water. And if you have a child who really loves a soda, we say choose a sparkling water with a little bit of um, freshly squeezed juice of some kind um, so that there is some flavor and the effervescence. Uh, we also look at exercise and we walk through um, that with families. Um, and we look at sleep because sleep also plays a role in weight gain and weight loss. And when we look at those different arenas and that in those different areas, we typically have a strategy or more to build on from just choosing moving away from moving toward real food, I guess. Okay. This next question is about probiotics. This parents had good success with probiotics, and she's asking how long is it possible to take probiotics for a child with a developmental disorder and digestive issues on a GFCF SF diet. The child's one year and 10 months old. She took probiotics for two weeks with, with good results. Two weeks is a standard course of medication in the country where this person lives. So she doesn't know what to do next. I'd like to give probiotics every day, but I don't know if it's safe. Um, we believe and we, through practice, um, have learned that um, it's entirely safe and in many cases appropriate to dose probiotics on a long-term basis or, and also a rotating basis. So this is not a situation where um, you will find um, an adverse reaction over long-term usage. Um, there's no evidence in the literature to suggest that. There, are, there is, you know, there are competing beliefs and belief systems regarding the use of probiotics. Some people believe you're repopulating the colon or populating the, the, the GI tract in this case. Some people believe once you use the probiotic and you stop using it, your microbiome tends to normalize back to baseline. We don't have enough data to know. It tends to shift, honestly, toward the latter, that 
once you stop giving that supplement, your body begins to move back to baseline, but we don't know long-term impact of really of that approach. We do know we're not causing long-term damage um, necessarily by using a probiotic, over the, an over-the-counter probiotic that um, is appropriate to the individual. The child that is in question is old enough now, based on what we know about use of various different probiotic strains, um, that I, I, I didn't hear which particular strain she was using, but it should not be a problem to continue its use. Okay. So I have a parent asking about related to probiotics, but also to all the other supplements that you've touched on, about how you find a practitioner who's qualified and, and talented in treat, managing a treatment plan for an individual using these different strategies, particularly somebody who's knowledgeable about diet and uh, what you were just talking about, about different weights and what can be appropriate just based on the individual profile. So if somebody's looking for, for a practitioner in their area, what are some things that they can look for? I think that um, the questions that we ask and that I encourage families that we work with to ask are, um, what's your experience in dealing with children with autism? What's your experience in dealing with specialized dietary interventions? How long have you been practicing in this arena? There is a, um, a dietetic subgroup. Um, the Registered Dietitians Association has a subgroup that is functional dietetics. Essentially, it's a, a holistic subgroup, which they have a list on the FNCE website that can get you to those individuals, um, meaning they have a more holistic and functional approach to the practice of dietetics in general. Um, more often than not, for me, the best way to find a practitioner is by word of mouth um, because you just don't. Um, there are no real um, lists and you have to do the homework, unfortunately, to find people who have the type of experience that I think we require in this community. Um, so parents, uh, parent lists, um, and there are a number of publications out now, too, that have been written by people who have worked in this community for years that are available. And I think um, you can also begin to explore some of that information on the autism.com website to see some of those practitioners and learn more about their beliefs and their practices. Um, and that's a, good, that's a good starting point. Right. And I think also uh, just local parent support groups talking to other parents if they've got a licensed professional who they're working with who's who's knowledgeable and experienced or who's very interested in it and willing to do some of the legwork to learn more about it. I think that can be a strategy if you're far from from any um, currently practicing practitioners. But I know a lot of parents do travel to receive appropriate treatment. And if it, that's something that you can do, that's always something to consider as well. Um, there are, there are options for treatment from afar. I know that, um, Kelly, you can probably speak to this a little bit for phone consults and that sort of thing. Yes, I think that um, most of the clinicians who are not MDs or DOs who practice nutrition in this community are able to provide consultation services via phone or Skype. Um, it's a little bit trickier because in a perfect world you have a local practitioner who you can work with to get some of the measurements um, that we need, but sometimes we do that with pediatricians. Um, sometimes we have other dietitians who only treat adults, for example, who will help us out in that situation. Um, so we can make it work, but as with any clinician, it's always better for me if I see the child in the room um, and can assess that way as well. Okay, great. Now you touched on this a bit, but I've gotten some more questions about, um, about foods. And 
And so one of the sort of the theme of a lot of these questions is my son really will only eat junk food and why won't my child eat vegetables? What, what's stopping them from wanting to eat fruits and vegetables? Why are they only attracted to these other foods? Can you talk a little bit about that, how that relates to, I mean, I think probably all children, but sometimes more intensely in, in kids on the spectrum? Sure. I, I think that um, for me, it's really important that uh, because this is a behavior that we see fairly commonly in the population that we serve, it's really important to tease out what's driving it because truly it could simply be a behavior, but it could also be a number of other things. It could be a latent allergy that we don't know about, that we want to learn about. It could be an oral motor issue. Um, it could be um, some sort of GI response that um, causes, you know, any number of uh, levels of discomfort and pain for the child so they've learned to avoid certain foods. They also, many of our kids that we see also learn to um, express preference for foods that are comforting to them. Um, and some children, frankly, gravitate towards crunchy um, or soft textures or temperature or heat and part of a feeding workup would really evaluate all of those pieces. So we would understand what that oral motor situation is like, and we would understand um, what the GI situation is like, because hopefully we would have some data in that process to drive it. We'd understand family history of allergies, family history of food intolerance, and all of that data would then help us create a plan to successfully address and introduce food. So the child could be, one, have an expanded diet, but also, um, be a part of that process and be successful in it. Okay, so the next question, it's about, you're going to have to explain what this is. It says, is there any therapeutic benefit to the low FODMAP diet? Um, great question. Uh, the low FODMAP diet is a diet that excludes a number of foods that create uh, fructooleosaccharides, um, and essentially um, the, these uh, dietary components um, have been linked to um, causing a discomfort, GI discomfort, I, what we've labeled IBS symptoms, um, and in terms of therapeutic benefit, it is, it is a diet that's very similar to other diets that we use, and when we um, uh, employ a low FODMAP approach, it's to tease out response. So if we know there's no overt inflammation in the GI tract, if we know there are, there's no um, full-blown celiac diagnosis, for example, but we still have a child or an adolescent or an adult who has ongoing cramping and diarrhea, um, a low FODMAP approach is something that originated in Australia and has been uh, used in various university hospital and now um, is generalized to many practices. Um, it's just a, a dietary uh, requirement that r would restrict all grains rather than just a gluten-free diet, for example, with a number of other uh, exclusions as well. Um, but it really can resolve symptoms. More than one client has come in with um, what we've labeled, what has been labeled in other practices as IBS, and they've failed to address that through either medication or other dietary change and a low FODMAP approach can help resolve that and create, you know, symptom free, so no cramping and formed bowel movements in a matter of days. The caveat for me there is that as with any approach, and this one in particular I think, we are talking about an approach that might be um, addressing a symptom and I really want to look for the underlying cause that it might be um, addressing. So while it might work therapeutically and make someone symptom free, I also want to understand more about why it's happened in the first place and how we can get them back to baseline. 
Um, so it's really a two or three-fold process for me. Okay, so related to that, so if, if there's a nutritional deficiency or, or some sort of other issue that, that's biological in nature, could that affect choosiness in food choice? I mean, could that be part of the picture? Uh, it can, absolutely. Um, because our experience has shown that um, many kids that we work with um, can come in and be self-selecting to a single food or a, f a few foods, and they've learned that those are the foods that don't make their stomachs hurt. And until we do a workup, we don't understand why they've self-limited to a particular thing. And that workup may, one component of it, can be a FODMAPS approach. Okay, and related to workups, I've gotten this question quite a few times or, or related questions. Is there a test that will tell us if our child has a gluten or dairy or soy issue? Um, there are a number of tests out there now uh, that look at gluten, dairy, and soy responsiveness on many different levels. So there's a true celiac test for gluten. There are gluten sensitivity panels that are available now. There are, um, there are IgG and IgA, I mean, I'm sorry, IgG and IgE food responsiveness tests, so true allergies and food intolerances, and we can look at those three proteins on all of those levels, and sometimes we get positive results back, and that helps guide us in a, a, uh, a direction in terms of treatment and intervention, but sometimes we get back entirely negative panels, and most, if not all, of the professionals that I know who work in this arena still believe the gold standard for understanding whether a child is a gluten, casein, soy responder is an elimination diet. Um, so while we have some data, it can't, for whatever reason, we still can't define from a laboratory perspective exactly the children who will be dietary responders and those who will not. So some children will not respond to the diet, or may, are you saying that the response will vary depending that there are different types of responses? There are different types of responses to the diet. I think that um, we have children, you know, I've seen many children over the past however many years who test on paper negative for any response to those potential protein concerns and the family chooses or we recommend removal of gluten, casein, and soy anyway and the child ha has a marked change in both GI status and behavior. We have children who test positive on tests showing they do evidence some sensitivity to one or more of those proteins. And even in the families who collect the best data and are meticulously compliant with any dietary intervention, their children may have no or a negligible response. And we just don't have, the science isn't far enough along for us to understand why that is. Do you know what the percentage is approximately for kids who do respond versus kids who do not? Um, it's so tricky because until probably 2012, um, most of the children who came in for treatment in our clinic were treatment naive, meaning they had not, families had not tried um, interventions. And so one of the first and basic interventions that we recommended was dietary change. And so because of that, we were able to clearly track it. Um, and in that window, we learned that over, you know, the 2004 to 2012 window, about 78%, I think, um, of the children that we worked with who we placed and monitored on a gluten and casein-free diet responded positively. Granted, we were asking them to do other things as well as that, so add a multivitamin, add an essential fatty acid. 
I don't have that data now in the past four years because more often than not, the information is out there and when a family reaches our clinic, they've already implemented a diet. So I can't monitor it. Okay. So this is a question I think you'll like because <laughs> I think this comes up a lot. And it's something that I think researchers talk about too as, as being a question. So here goes. This person's saying, my three and a half year old takes cod liver oil, multivitamins, probiotics, vitamin D, zinc, and more. We've been combining these supplements based on their dosages and time frame, once a day or twice a day, in a sippy cup with some water and pureed vegetable fruit blend. Is the supplemental effectiveness combined? Is it is it effective to combine these in this way? Is it just a matter of getting it in whatever way I'm able? Could there be conflicts between different nutrients? I just want to make sure that I'm doing it as effectively as I can. Great question. Um, I, the answer, though, depends on exactly what's going in to that um, mixture. And in general, I would say there are a few things that you want to think knowledgeably about when you're combining things. So. Combining a multivitamin and components of a multivitamin together in general shouldn't be any trouble um, because in essence from a synthetic, from a lab perspective, that's what we've done and put it in a capsule. Um, so combining a multivitamin with an extra B or an extra D dose really shouldn't be an issue. Um, but minerals get sort of tricky. So when you start thinking about um, calcium dosage and magnesium dosage and zinc dosage and copper dosage in particular, if you have a vitamin that has copper in it, um, you want to make sure that you are, um, if not separating those doses, then giving them multiple times across the day because those minerals compete for um, absorption receptors. And, um, calcium and they become synergistic when they're dosed together. So ideally you give calcium with magnesium all the time. Um, but you're careful about uh, dosing zinc, calcium, magnesium at the same time because you're not going to get full dosage of those in all likelihood. Combining essential fatty acids or a cod liver oil should not be an issue. I often recommend that families dose the oils with food because the fat, it, again, it's kind of a synergistic thing. Having the extra fat with the meal will allow extra uptake of fat-soluble vitamins that are consumed. Um, and in terms of other uh, issues that I would worry about, um, I don't think anything that is used in a basic or fundamental treatment program um, needs to be considered carefully, but if there's anything that, you know, you're treating that's a targeted treatment dose, for example, um, such as a prescription folinic acid that is many, the therapeutic dose is very high, that needs particular consideration about when and what to dose it with. Uh, but otherwise, you just want to make sure that you're dosing things. The other things you want to make sure of are if you, your child is on a casein-free diet, you're dosing that calcium and magnesium also with vitamin D and vitamin K because those all work together for bone level absorption, um, things like that. Okay, so the next question is about is it okay for my child with autism to consume caffeinated beverages? Um, that depends, I think, on uh, uh, the child and the child's age. Um, I typically, from, from a nutrition perspective alone and what we know about the powerful um, draw or need for caffeine once it's introduced, don't like to suggest caffeinated beverages for, um, you know, non-adolescents, anyone younger than a teen. Um, for teenagers then, I think about what that caffeine is and is it just a, an iced tea or a hot tea 
or a coffee or is it a soda? And if it's the latter, then I would say none of us really need soda because along with that caffeine comes a lot of other stuff that we don't need to be putting in. Um, so in general, I, if a, you know, I have many high school clients now and many of them from a social perspective alone have friends who um, go to a coffee shop or stop at some place on the way home and they want options and we talk through that and um, you know, meeting for a coffee on a Saturday morning isn't, isn't a terrible idea. Um, it's just six coffees would be not the right thing to do. Okay. Um, that's probably true for all of us, right? Right. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so this next one, this person's got a question about, um, again, about using the GFCF diet. So she's asking, what would you suggest for a child who will not take any form of supplements, not even crushed or mixed in food? Somehow she knows they are there, even if they're mashed in a shake. Our daughter eats a wide variety of food now. We've been considering doing a restrictive diet to see if any improvement occurs, but I'm concerned about needed nutrients if we limit her. I understand. So I think that um, there are some options out there that uh, might be a good uh, approach to the supplement question. There are multivitamin powders that are available that are virtually non-detectable when mixed in the appropriate juice, and they are therapeutic powders developed specifically for the kids that we serve. Um, that might be an option because it's not crushing, it's not. There are um, other children that we've worked with in terms of getting supplements in. We've looked at gummies for a short term and we've worked with, you know, the least, I guess, uh, negative side effects from the use of a gummy versus um, a, a typical supplement. We also have we also suggest and work with behavioral therapists who teach the children that we serve to take their supplements. It becomes part of that ABA program um, because my bias clearly is I can help your child, help you help your child learn and grow if I can make them as healthy as possible. And so for me, getting those supplements in really is a priority. Um, and then to speak to the other part of the question about changing the diet and um, worrying about nutrient access and then further limiting um, what's going in. Our experience clinically has been that children expand their diets when we remove or suggest an elimination diet of one or more proteins. So if we ask families to go on a dairy-free diet, for example, um, the diet expands. If we ask them to go on a gluten and casein-free diet, the child actually expands the diet, not further limits it. And then just from that perspective that we'll be taking away dairy, um, those things can easily be addressed now by quality um, food substitutes that are out there. Um, and vi a vitamin D and calcium supplement would be necessary or you'd want to monitor those levels and make sure that you, she's getting what she needs. Um, but I, I, I would encourage you to do, uh, to work through the supplement situation from a behavioral perspective and to not be afraid of trialing an elimination diet if it's recommended um, because in our truly far more children eat more foods once they begin a targeted elimination diet than they did before. Okay. So this next person is talking again about GFCF. They're saying, what can we use to help create the best digestion possible? My son is under GFCF, SF, and low oxalate diet, but his digestive functions are still low and problematic. Which nutrients can help fight against excessive yeast and diversify bacteria in the gut. Can we replace rice and potatoes with cassava, sweet potatoes, and turnip? Goodness. Um, lots of questions. Yeah. So, I, I'm uh, curious, so let me know if I can uh, give any of those. Um, 
I, I think that um, I would need to know more about that dietary approach and how it was created to be able to fully and accurately answer some of that question. Um, but I, I feel like one, yes, replacing rice and potatoes with the, the alternatives that are mentioned would be ideal. Um, two, I, I feel like there are several things that you could do that would help and assist with your child's digestion and absorption. I strongly encourage you to talk to a professional about it because the combination of those things is what's going to be key and that would be some digestive enzyme, a probiotic, one of any number of antifungal issue or um, uh, antifungal um, supplements, uh, and then some sort of soluble and insoluble fiber, and there are a number of those products that you'd want to make sure meet the criteria of your current dietary um, program. So there are, um, the one thing that comes to the top of my head would be a quality aloe vera water, which is um, a good fiber that could help build up, and if you use something like magnesium, to move and um, encourage bowel contractions, then um, that should help stimulate more appropriate GI function, I would hope. Okay. So this next one, my child only eats hot dogs and mac and cheese. How can I make sure he's getting the nutrients he needs? What risks does he face if he's not getting what he needs? So my concern, I guess, is we, um, we have all of these um, nutrient needs that we know about and have known about for some time. And all of us have deficits in our intake at various points in time um, or on an ongoing and long-term basis. So when I think about a child like this that we serve, and many, many, many children that we serve are in that position. So understand that you're not alone first. Um, the first thing you want to do really is an analysis and see which, nu which exact nutrients are missing. Um, and then from an intervention perspective, for me, I would feel really strongly about addressing short-term concerns first, which would be all those vitamins and, um, you know, bioflavonoids and uh, things that, that the darkly colored fruits and vegetables that he's not getting, those are things that, from an immune system perspective, are beneficial short and long term. We know that. Um, and so I would think through, you know, supplementing in some way to include all of those nutrients. Um, and oils, uh, and then work out a longer-term plan because we do know that nutritional status in childhood affects a number of different things as adults. Um, so for me, I'm troubleshooting and problem-solving with families, moving from that hot dog and mac and cheese place, both to, to broaden a diet short-term and I'm thinking about that child 25 or 30 years down the line and health implications for missing intake of certain nutrients in childhood as well. Okay, this next question is about melatonin. This is a concerned grandmother. She says, my eight-year-old grandson is given a milligram of melatonin every night to help him sleep. Are there any negative implications associated with this? There are multiple studies now uh, out that um, support the use of a melatonin in that range in children and show no adverse responses, short or long term. So one of the biggest concerns that was raised in the literature early on when melatonin became something that was used across the you know country, uh, really and across needs. Um, was that if you used a supplement at one, some point you would not be able to produce that uh, yourself and your body would suffer for it. Uh, but in fact, the research tells us otherwise, that it's something you can use for a sustained period of time and stop using and your body can compensate once that happens. Okay. This is a, another diet question. Uh, this person says, 
their child's been on the diet, the GFCF diet, for several months, but they have not noted improvement, although maybe some. Is it worth continuing? He really misses his bread, pasta, etc. They've replaced with alternatives, but he does not seem to like them. So I think the, the answer is it depends, because I would want to make really sure, if I were in your shoes, that you've completed this intervention, that it's been 100% um, compliance from him um, when he's with you and when he's not with you. Um, and I really suggest, and we suggest to families, that they trial interventions for a minimum of 90 days. We know that um, <clears throat> it typically takes that long or longer for gluten responsive antibodies to leave the system and one infraction can, and the literature has told us this, can take up to six months to clear the system in a responsive individual. Um, so I try to ask families to follow an intervention for 90 days and evaluate at that point in time. Um, it could be that it's simply not an intervention that your son will, will respond to and that's okay. Um, but I would want to make sure and maybe get some professional eyes on the picture if you don't have that already to help you troubleshoot, okay, what could we be missing in this, in this piece and in this picture? And when you say that he has improved maybe, does that mean from a GI perspective or does that mean from a sleep perspective? Um, because all, there are many, many questions that come along with that and I think that thinking through it on a number of different levels um, and extending the time you stay on the diet to at least 90 days could be beneficial. Okay, Kelly, you've talked quite a bit about the evidence that's out there, and I know you did a webinar recently talking about this sort of the state of the research. So this person's asking, how would you evaluate the evidence that's currently available on interventions? And what do you think of the value of future nutritional RCT trials determining the effect on symptoms? Oh, I, um, I wish there were more uh, data out there faster on um, dietary intervention in particular. Um, I, I feel like the most recent, um, there are a couple of papers that I feel like are, are pretty solid and um, in terms of review papers that kind of one in particular that looks at the gluten and casein free diet but essentially it was it came out with an inconclusive result and and in my mind the, that is because there were some issues with study design um, in a number of the studies that were included in that review for example the time frame that children were kept on a on an elimination diet or the exclusion of children from participating in the study because they had gastrointestinal symptoms. So those are, those are a couple of reasons I feel like um, that the state of the literature with respect to gluten and casein uh, dietary approaches needs to come a long way. Um, I think that other, there are other interventions that are being evaluated that I'm hopeful about. Um, the problem with any dietary intervention, honestly, is that there is very little research funding available for this work because there's no product associated with it. There's no, um, there's nothing other than, I mean, we're talking about food and we're talking about teaching people how to eat appropriately. And it's not as if we're looking at a digestive enzyme, for example, or another medication. So getting research funding to do that has been tricky f across the board for researchers here who are looking at these approaches. <laughs>